Hi, everybody, and uh, thanks so much for joining us. And thank you again for your flexibility about very quickly transferring onto Zoom, which I know that we've all become very, very adept at. And thank you particularly to Sarah Hanson Young, our guest speaker tonight, because I know we were really looking forward to, to getting together in uh, in person, but we're oh. promising that it will definitely be happen next time. So um, obviously this is a really important opportunity to reflect on recent events in Canberra and uh, what it means for the future of women in politics. And before we leap into the conversation, let me um, briefly formally introduce Sarah, um, who's been a senator for South Australia for 13 years. She was the youngest woman ever elected to federal parliament at 25 in 2008. She currently holds the Arts, Media and Communications, Environment and Biodiversity, Water in the Murray-Darling Basin, Tourism and Dental Health Portfolios for the Greens Party. Is there any portfolio that you do not hold, Sarah? <laughs> but that must be asked of you every time. You've obviously got the importance one, though, because you've got arts and environment, which are hugely important. Um, Sarah has, of course, backed some really diverse initiatives to encourage equality of opportunity for women and is a leading advocate for paid parental leave and universal access to childcare to help boost women's workforce and community participation. In 2018, she published On Guard, a personal essay and call to arms on the rampant sexism in politics. So, Sarah, I might I might ask my first question um, about um, a recent podcast um, that I heard that with Catherine Murphy where you stated, quote, we are in the midst of a reckoning and it couldn't come soon enough. Can you please share your perspective on recent events and, and the impact they're having? Thank you so much, Carol, for having me tonight. And hello to um, everybody out there. I'm so sorry it's not in person. Um, but, um, look, let me tell you, from those of us uh, around the rest of the country, um, for people in Melbourne, um, we have really been thinking of you greatly over the last um, few days and uh, hope that, uh, the, the lockdown ends sooner rather than later for you. Um, look, Carol, to your question about uh, you know, the reckoning and what has uh, occurred this year in particular, I think is really fundamental. And I've seen a significant shift, uh, not just here in Canberra, uh, but and Parliament House, but uh, across the country. And we saw that with the women's marches that almost spontaneously um, uh, self-organised, often by, in many places around the country, by women who'd never participated in, uh, in rallies or protests before. They certainly hadn't ever organised one. Um, and this was a, a, a gut reaction to what they saw, what we all saw unfolding in the very place that should be as we know, setting the standards of laws and regulations and uh, the uh, the benchmark for how uh, we think women and um, everybody should be treated and uh, respected. And when Brittany Higgins so bravely came forward and told her story and blew the whistle of her experience, I think her very direct and raw uh, and uh, clear articulation of her experience um, hit a nerve because so many of us uh, either um, have experienced uh, situations like this or know someone close to us or in our circles who have a very similar story. So we, we saw in her um, a witness of our own life in many ways and um, it was really uh, Brittany Higgins coming forward and finally saying what so many um, had uh, been wanting to say for a long time and splashing that directly in the halls of the most powerful building in the country, uh, a, a place where I know many of you um, uh, are working hard to see um, if you can get elected uh, and join us here. And um, I really think it was, it was a combination of the timing uh, but also just how um, 
direct she was with her and how frank and open she was with her experience. People couldn't turn away. Uh, it was so uh, honest. And with that came this kind of avalanche of people saying, well, actually, we're sick of this. And, and women saying we're sick of this. And in this building, uh, women who have worked as staffers, as advisors, as journalists, as politicians um, have also said, um, yeah, we're sick of it too. And we're also sick of uh, turning a blind eye to it, to our constituents, mm. to our communities who are feeling this and living through this on, yeah. on a regular basis in their own lives. Mm. Um, and I think from a politician's perspective, um, when you are confronted with something that um, is so real, um, it's very difficult to, to, to gloss over when you know that the people looking to you for leadership and for representation um, are saying, well, I know it's real because it happens to me. Or there's a story like this that, that is very similar to, to, you know, my sister or my mother or my, um, or, or, or my girlfriend. Um, so I think really it was, the, it was both the timing but also the way uh, and the place that it happened. I don't think we could escape it. Yeah. So when I spoke to Kate Ellis about, um, and you feature quite a, quite heavily in Kate's book, which is a terrific book, Sex, Lies and um, it's a great Question book. Time, such a clever title. Um, <laughs> when I spoke to her about this, I actually asked her why does it take a woman to leave politics before they actually address the issue. Now, she said to me, um, oh, I was just too busy. And I, I found that to be absolutely honest. And I said it in the interview. I found that a little disingenuous. Why? Mm -hmm. But why does it take, I mean, you've been brave, but why does it take a lot of women in probably the major parties to um to, to leave politics before they're prepared to speak out about the shocking behaviour that goes on? Um, it's for the very same reason that sexualized bullying and intimidation exists in the first place, Carol. It's in and of itself silencing. To stand up and speak out on these things, would have to you would have to admit that it's happening to you. And the moment you admit that this is happening to you, the moment you are uh, proving that you're not up to the job that you are too weak, that you are playing the gender card, that you uh, can't just roll with the punches, quote, unquote, which is what, you know, um, some of my female colleagues have been told to do by male colleagues of theirs. Um, so I think it, I mean, I, we, you know, I, I've got a lot of time for Kate Ellis. Um, her book is fantastic. If, if you haven't read it, please go and get a copy of it. Um, the interviews that I did with her for that book, um, were um, very difficult, actually, but um, the most difficult thing, and I was very honest with her, actually, mm. in my um, encounter and, and, and as I was kind of telling her some of my, she was asking questions and my experience and I was telling her, and when she said, um, uh, she was like, well, that's terrible. This, and I said, well, where were you? Yeah. You were there, Kate. And I very directly put that to her. And she and, and to, to her credit, she accepted it. And she said, yeah, you're right. I, I, I didn't do anything for you. I didn't help you. Mm. And I guess one of the reasons why I've been very keen to be involved in this program and, um, you know, f trying to find ways to keep uh, supporting women from whatever side of politics, because I actually think we need more women in in, in politics, regardless of what colour um, you have on your core flute or your how to vote card. I'm a big believer in that. Um, and the reason, uh, you know, we, that needs to start from the beginning of when, uh, as women, we enter into politics. So we create a culture that is expected that we actually support each other and work collaboratively where we can. Um, and you shouldn't have to leave politics to then become best, you know, to support each other and become best friends. I, yeah. I don't think that's good enough. I think we yeah. actually have to, we have to change the model. If women are going yeah. to take uh, the power and, and, and take our rightful place in parliaments and in politics, we've got to do it differently to the way the blokes do it. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And which sort of segues into my next question so brilliantly because I was talking to um, a colleague just last week and um, she was telling me about she she's actually a, a member of parliament, in state parliament, and um, she was telling me about um, a situation that she was having with um, uh, making a speech and uh, and and a fellow female politician from the other side of the house who normally she has a great relationship with actually stood up and started screaming at her in a way that was totally unacceptable and actually she ended up um, she ended up being um, asked to leave the house and um, I, I'm just wondering that do, you know because I agree with you 100 percent I think that women can set a whole new standard around the way politics is played out. But is it still so unrealistic? I mean, do women politicians still have to conform to the, the male stereotypical behaviours that have been the status quo for the last 200 years? How do we start to be different and do things differently? Um, I think there's, the, there's a couple of things we've got to acknowledge in this. Um, Firstly, of course, we're not all the same just because we're women. <laughs> we're not all the same. We, we, we're not, we don't come from the same parties. We don't come from the same backgrounds. We may not have uh, the same uh, uh, desires for or, or ideas of, of what it is that, um, that's uh, a priority. We have mm -hmm. different strengths and weaknesses. So that we're not all going to be the same, and I'm not suggesting for a second that we are. Um, uh, so, of course, there's going to be some women who feel quite comfortable being able to um, uh, come in and take that more traditional mm -hmm. kind of uh, aggressive op oppositional uh, politics perspective and, and behave in that way. There's other, there's other women who that is very, not, very much not their style. Um, but uh, I do think generally that, and I've... I've witnessed this, you know, I've been in this place now for 13 years and being in the Senate is quite, you know, for, for those of you thinking about entering federal politics, I, I must say I love the Senate. Um, the, being in the Senate it does in one way force um, members to spend probably a bit more time uh, with people from other parties and on issues, broader issues, rather than just kind of talking just about your your specific local area. So you sometimes get a bit of a broader perspective on things. Um, uh, and I must say, through that process, when we've had more women on a committee, for example, the collaboration is much higher. Mm. The ability to talk through a recommendation uh, to be agreed to in a in a majority report, which uh, it's just a, a much simpler conversation to have if there's other women in the room. Uh, it, 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 it shouldn't be like that, but it is. And so I, I think women do bring something to the table that um, our male colleagues, um, you know, perhaps it's a, uh, perhaps they just don't, they don't think that that's, um, uh, that that takes too much time. You know, it's, it's more efficient just to go, one, two, three, I've got the numbers bang. We're not talking about this. We already start, we already decided it at the pub anyway, so this is just the formality. Um, you know, there's a lot of that attitude. And I think women perhaps, because often we do when we come into politics, come from uh, a diverse, uh, a range of backgrounds, um, we're used to have, having to negotiate, to listen, uh, to coordinate, um, Women rarely get handed a, a position in politics uh, because uh, someone owes it to them. Uh, you have to work bloody hard to get here. And then, as we know, a lot of women have to keep working very hard to keep the seat, uh, So whether that's from their parties or from their communities. So I think there's those skills are just something that women do bring forward without even thinking about it, and uh, we should be celebrating that. Of course, and I'm sure you've talked about this a lot with other guests, um, that critical mass, once you get more women in, around that committee room table, once you get more women uh, in that caucus room uh, or in that parliamentary friends group, um, it really does mean some of those cultures do start changing. Yeah. And um, 
I was talking about the Kathleen Murphy podcast before and I actually listened to another one this morning uh, that, on The Guardian. It's called The Full Story. It's actually a really good podcast. And um, she was talking about her role on the internal Kunkel inquiry into the um, backgrounding of Brittany Higgins and her partner by the mm -hmm. Prime Minister's um, office and, and then more generally about the inquiries um, that have been, in, you know, in, in train for the mm. last several months, which, of course, none of us have ever have heard any discussion about whatsoever. But what do you think of the role of the media um, in the last few months? And, and, and has it been an appropriate role or mm. can they do more or should they have done less? Um. I think that's a really interesting element to all of this because often, so often, of course, the representation of women in, in, in politics uh, through the media has been incredibly detrimental to women being able to get on and do our jobs and have, uh, you know, a lot of those stereotypes have been reinforced. We, we it's, everyone would know what we, about how Julia Gillard was treated, for example, um, and I think history will... Uh, reflect upon her leadership in a much um, kinder and uh, um, uh, positive way than how she was actually represented uh, at the time. Um, and so I think in, in many respects the media have been um, uh, a huge contributor to uh, keeping women, okay, you want to be in politics, that's fine, but we'll keep you at this level. Don't get ahead of yourself. Mm. All right? Just... <laughs> <laughs> you it, don't get too don't don't get too uh, uh, too cocky, um, but I think what we saw with the last few uh, months, and particularly um, the explosion of um, uh, anger and frustration, and enough the sense of enough and the reckoning, um, was felt by journalists in this building as much as the staff. Mm as much as the politicians. So when I talk about um, needing more women in politics, I try and uh, I think it's really important for us to, to be um, clear that we're not, I mean, I know this is a program for getting, um, encouraging more women to actually run for office, um, but actually we need more women at all levels. We need more women as staff. We need more women as senior staff. I'm not sure if anyone saw that article uh, that was published over the weekend uh, that uh, looked at the numbers of senior staff versus um, uh, other staff in this building, and overwhelmingly they're dominated by men. And, you know, that, though, that means that they've got, you know, they're on uh, salaries of 200000 uh, they've often got a car, they've got unlimited travel, which means travel allowance, they've got great superannuation, and yet the majority of staff... <laughs> Uh, in the uh, as electorate officers uh, in the lower rungs who don't have any access to any of those things um, are women. And so even within the staff, there is such a, a clear um, imbalance. And then you look at the press gallery and, uh, again, um, the, uh, the, the editors, the senior correspondents, um, overwhelmingly tend to be men. And you see the younger women in particular who get rolled into the Canberra Press Gallery. Uh, they're, 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 you know, overloaded with work, more and more so because of the state of journalism, of course. Um, and the culture on them, uh, at, on this building, is quite significant. So I think what has happened actually is there's been a, and I've spoken to a number of people in the press gallery about this, the representation of what's happened over the last few months has um, not completely, but almost uh, you can tell whether an article or a, or a package for the TV news that night had been put together by a male reporter or put together by a female reporter. It's been really quite interesting, the gender divide in the reporting. Yeah, but so but how are we going to change that? Because, I mean, it's not like we haven't been talking about this for a very long time. Yes, absolutely. And, look, I... Uh, this whole this whole few months, when um, when Brittany Higgins when this Brittany Higgins story broke, mm. um, 
it was the beginning of a parliamentary fortnight um, and I remember, you know, I, I was arriving, it was about 7.30 in the morning on the Monday and um, I, I was in the comm car and I was driving up the gates and the, and the headlines were being read out and, it, and the story broke that a young staffer um, uh, had made an accusation that she'd been raped in a minister's office. And I, um, and I just went, whoa, this is, this is big. This is, this is going to dominate. But as the days rolled out, this building what became, it was like uh, the building was in shock. And it's not because, and I think it, we need to be really clear here, it wasn't because people didn't believe her. Actually, what was shocking was that people did believe her um, and it was Can I interrupt you? Can I just mm. interrupt you there? It's interesting because we we always hear about the gossip that goes mm. on in mm. Parliament House in Canberra, mm. and mm. and it's not as though nobody knew that she, you know what had happened to her. Um, she had actually reported it to the police, notwithstanding she didn't follow through on that. Mm. And the minister certainly knew, and there were advisors that knew. Um, how come it hadn't become, you know, sort of well known that, you know, this had happened to Brittany? Well, I think that's a really, really interesting point. And, um, Carol, I think it points to the fact that of how serious it was and how diabolical uh, politically um, this was uh, for the government. Um I think it's, you know, and this place is, there is a, uh, it, it did seem to be a bit of a contradiction because this place thrives on rumour and innuendo and speculation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> However, um, that's all very well and good if it's being used for, for as a political weapon to knock down your opponents, to uh, smear uh, the person who's about to speak you know, um, uh, speak next to put people off their game. And that's the type of, you know, um, behaviour that I've, of course, experienced and have spoken out about. Um, but I think this was kept so tightly, this information was kept so tightly controlled because, and Brittany Higgins has said this herself, that she, it was seen as a political problem, not as a crime. And so, and in this building, information is power. Uh, Rumour and scandal is weaponised and uh, if, if only people on your side know this, will you keep it extremely tight because of how dangerous it could be. And yeah, that so is, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you a, a, a provocative question this. <laughs> so... Um, do you think that the reason that it wasn't weaponized was because the behaviours, the really bad behaviours, are just rife throughout politics as opposed to being on one side of politics rather than the other? And, of course, you're not going to start attacking someone if you're actually guilty of that act yourself. Um, that is a provocative question, but I think it's a really reasonable one. And, um, yes, I think there's a bit of that. I think there's a bit of... Uh, you know, we better not rock the boat or shine the light over here because we don't, you know, our behaviour over there hasn't been uh, great either. I think there's absolutely a bit of that. And, of course, that comes back to this culture of silence and this culture of, um, uh, you know, what goes on in, in Canberra stays in Canberra, um, that type of, um, you know, it's the boys' club, Carol. That's what it yeah. is. Yeah, and it comes yeah. to and political divides. I can tell you. Yeah, and and of course you refused to be silent, and in fact you took a defamation action against um, one of your parliamentary colleagues, and you won. Um, and and I know it's been said that it wasn't a huge victory. I think it was an absolutely gigantic victory. Um, and really momentous, and the courage that it took from you to to pursue that was incredible. Can you talk a little bit about that? Mm. 
Um, it was, uh, you know, the moment of deciding to stand up is one thing. <laughs> um, the decision to keep going and keep fighting it is another. And I think it's very easy for us to, uh, you know, when you're, we're watching somebody else in a situation, and I think this comes back to this idea that we've got to support women when they stand up and um, because it was tough to make the decision to stand up and call it out, but it was much tougher to stand still in the wind afterwards. And um, I think at, at that moment is when, you know, I, I was encouraged actually less by my um, colleagues um, in and around this uh, building and um, across politics generally, but actually far more by regular um, women and decent men in the community who just similar to what we've said, what, and I've spoken to Brittany Higgins about this a lot, I've spoken to Christine Holgate about this a lot, is when you do stand up and say something and break the mould and speak out and break the silence, there is a such a flood of uh, other people around the community and at their everyday lives going, whoa, this means something to me. Mm. And it actually was that encouragement that, uh, it was both in, inspired me to keep going and encouraged me to keep going, but also I, I've got to be really honest with you, it, it was quite heavy on the shoulders mm. too. I felt like there wasn't, I, I felt like, oh, if I had pulled out now, I'd be letting down all those people. And I think, yeah. you know, it's one of those challenges when we talk about um, why would you want to go into politics, what are the challenges of going into politics, um, we rarely talk about um, those moments where even when you know it's the right thing to do, mm. do you have the energy to do it? Mm. Do you have the ability to do it? And um, sometimes actually you do it not because you, not because um, you don't, uh, uh, you're not, you don't want to, uh, but you do it because you feel like you've got no other choice. And that's, we often think about those conversations when we're talking about a bind and you do something you don't support. I'm talking about the other. I'm talking about when it is the right thing to do, but you keep you, you're doing it actually because of the the uh, of not wanting to let other people down. Yeah, which is phenomenal. And uh, of course, we have a session um, around that you know addresses those sorts of issues in terms of um, ethical dilemmas in politics mm. because and how do we resolve those ethical dilemmas in politics and I think mm. that it must be a huge issue for really good people who go into politics around how they how they make those decisions and how they how they resolve ethical dilemmas and you talk about you talk about the support of of decent men T tell mm. us about that a little bit um I think it's a really important part of this whole conversation and that you mentioned before, Carol, that um, women in politics bringing a, a different um, uh, style and attitude and um, a more respectful debate. The community actually want this. The voters actually want this. And just like having more women in politics would, I believe, <laughs> lift the level of debate uh, and uh, and and respect, um, and you know probably we'd get a bit more work done generally, and a few more outcomes. That's what the community wants. It's good for them too. Actually, mm -hmm. it's about them. It should be about them. We're only here because we're here representing the community. Um, but it's the same with. Um, there are so many men in Australia who are so who are have had enough too were so yeah. angry and frustrated with this toxic masculinity that refuses to allow us to address these issues that women in our lives uh, are treated appallingly. They're not given a fair go. That they're not treated properly, you know, from, from a very young age. I've, there's a, um, 
you know, obviously my hometown is in Adelaide and there's a, an amazing group of young high school girls who in the last two weeks have staged a walkout out of their school because a young uh, one of their students was uh, sexually um, assaulted by a fellow student. Uh, mm. It was kind of hushed up. The girls got together, said they'd stand up for her, and then as a result of that, all of these other stories have come out at the school. And um, I think it's incredibly, uh, you know, just amazing that so while the girls, these young uh, students, you know, female students led out, the, led this walkout outside the school, they were followed by a significant bunch of their male student uh, peers. And I think that is a really, really fundamental thing that has to change, has to yeah. change at that level. And so when I talk about um, women in politics being good for uh, equality and good for the community, I'm also saying it's it's good for men. Men want this too. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, of course, you chaired the parliamentary inquiry into Christine Holgate's departure following the Cartier Watches scandal and um, you recently developed a report with 25 recommendations. You publicly described the, the events leading up to Christine's departure as a schmozzle and that ultimately it was her reputation and job that was fat, uh, sacrificed. I'm really interested to hear why why you wanted to chair the inquiry mm. and um, and your reflections on the um, gender dimensions of this. Mm. Um, this is this has been fascinating because um, just watching how this unfolded, uh, this the, the week that all of this happened, and of course Christine Holgate, um, you know everybody would remember, you know she she was questioned in Senate estimates after it was revealed that she had uh, spent twenty thousand dollars on Cartier watches for a number of her staff who had. Uh, as gifts of thanks for um, a significant um, uh, deal that they'd been able to negotiate between the local post offices and the big banks. The big banks had forever said no and anyway, she'd said. And, of course, in hindsight, um, even, you know, Christine Holgate admitted in in the inquiry that probably that they probably weren't the right uh, gift of choice um, for, you know, what is a, 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 a public... Uh, entity. Um, having said that, I must say, I reckon if they'd been given $20,000 worth of bonuses, probably the question would never would have been asked in Senate estimates. So let's just, it, it's all about perception. Mm. Um, uh, but nonetheless, uh, but this all happened on the same week that there was a whole bunch of uh, scandals being uh, uncovered in relation to uh, an overpayment, a $30 million overpayment for uh, the uh, Western Sydney Airport. I don't know if you remember that um, uh, issue. Um, and we had, obviously, uh, Angus Taylor and a bunch of other... It was quite clear to me that mm. the reaction from the Prime Minister uh, and, and the government, the ministers involved, to Christine Holgate and this issue was... In out of kilter with their reaction uh, to, uh, you know, men in their own ranks who had already had actually been caught red-handed doing the wrong thing. Um, and so I think uh, it, it, undoubtedly it was gendered uh, from my, my, my the way I see it. I think if her name had been Christian rather than Christine Holgate, I suspect uh, she wouldn't have been told to go on the floor uh, by the Prime Minister there's a whole lot of other things that happened. It was, you know, it was it, it, it was unlawful what they did, actually. Um, they didn't follow the proper process. And as the evidence came out in the inquiry, which is a really tough one to chair, I must say, I had Pauline Hanson on one end and, uh, you know, Bridget McKenzie and uh, um, Kimberly Kitching on another. It was <laughs> Kim Carthroyd in the midst of all that. It was quite a um, uh, an array of... Uh, interested senators in that hearing um, and that inquiry, but it was quite clear with the evidence coming out that she had been not given a fair hearing. She had been, it had been expected that this kind of um, a treatment publicly of her would be enough for her to bow out and go quietly. Um, 
And then when she questioned it, they didn't know what to do. Mm. And I think um, the difference that that would have been if she had been a male CEO um, uh, is is quite stark. It, people wouldn't have stood for it. Um, and interestingly, the public didn't. It's, it's been, a, you know, as I said, you know, the, the outpouring of public support and people telling me their stories when I've come forward and spoken up from what um, the conversations I've had directly with Christine Holgate is very similar. She's had a very similar experience. Um, and, you know, she's a woman of privilege. She's got money. She's had one of some of the best, one of the best, you know, some of the best business roles in, in the country. Mm. Uh, she was well respected and yet she mm. was so publicly humiliated and bullied mm. and then sacked without any rights. Now, if that can happen to a, a woman in one of the most powerful and public roles in the country, again, what does that say about the woman who's working in a factory on the shop floor or behind a bar? Mm, absolutely. Or a young teacher in a high school. You know. Yeah, absolutely. And um, tell us a little bit, give us some insights into your conversations with Pauline Hanson, Kimberly Kitching and Bridget McKenzie with <laughs> Kim Carr out, outnumbered. <laughs> Um, fascinating, actually. I think, um, again, I think there's this part of the reckoning that's happening. Um, all of those women um, uh, could see what had happened to, to Christine Holgate. And, um, you know, I, it was, uh, it, it was, and, you know, each of them had their own kind of came from their own political perspective about it and had their own pet issue. But every one of them, as the evidence rolled out, uh, the conversations that we were having over the coffee break or as the next witness was coming in and negotiating over the recommendations was um, it was quite clear uh, that if this had been, if Christine had been a bloke, it wouldn't have happened like this and that the blokes wouldn't have been in the inquiry, uh, uh, you know, sticking up for her either, that, you know, we were the ones who were in there trying to get the evidence, building the case and um, and asking the tough questions. So, um you know, uh, I, I, there's very few things that Pauline and I agree on, um, but it was a you know I had some I've had some really interesting conversations about um, how women are bullied and treated by a men who think they're the boss, um, and so yeah, that's that opened my eyes a little bit to how things might operate in that office. That's so fascinating, and and let me ask you then is so. The men on the inquiry, did they understand where you were coming from or did they have a, a different slant on things? Um, I think the um, men on the inquiry, as, as the evidence was coming out, it, it, it became clearer and clearer to them that a proper process hadn't been followed and yeah. that was their focus. Uh, the process wasn't... Uh, the, 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 there'd been an injustice because the process hadn't been right. I think it was the women on the committee who understood that this wasn't something that happened overnight. Uh, mm. This was a, a, a this was an attitude um, that had been taken by the board, by members of the board and by the minister and the prime minister that they really thought, uh, uh, you know, you could kind of have such a knee-jerk reaction to this and she'd just go quietly. It's just been... A really rich conversation and, and so generous in terms of how open you've been in, in what you've shared. Um, I'm sure everyone has come away from this um, feeling like they have a better sense of everything that you're standing for and, and also what it means for, for all of these women as they, they step into those future political selves. So we really appreciate everything you do for this community. Um, and, yeah, please, please keep coming back. Carol, did, was there anything last that you wanted to say before we finish up? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Well, Sarah Hanson Young, what a standout you are! And um, thank you. It's you know, it's you are courageous, you are articulate, you are intelligent, and uh, you're just getting better and better. So um, <laughs> Thanks, I know you. I know you've been in politics for thirteen years, but we need you there probably for another thirteen years. <laughs> who basically set a new standard for the way we do politics as a nation because that, with those changes with people like you, 
that's the way we're going to start to deliver better decisions for us and outcomes for us as citizens. So thank you very much for the work that you do. It's fabulous. Oh, that, thank you. Um, that, that's incredibly um, Oh, that's very touching, Carol. Thank you so much. And the, the only thing I would um, like to say before I end is this few months has really been full on and awful and terrible. And, you know, in this building, there's been a kind of collective guilt that seeped through the corridors. Um, however, uh, I'm, I'm seeing real change in the fact that we can speak so openly about this, that there are people who would never even from the conservative sides, from blokes that, who, whose offices are across the hall from mine, uh, wanting to talk openly about what we do to make the place better for the, for the female staff in their office, let alone the um, female MPs. So um, change is afoot and, you know, if you want to get into politics, um, I think actually this is the time to do it as women. It really is. We need you. We need you. Do it and we'll be here for you. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone.